Welcome back from what I hope were some interesting breakout sessions downstairs. Um, as I said earlier, delighted today to welcome uh, Professor Dan Ariely, who is going to have a, a chat with us about behavioral insights. I think pretty much everybody who's spoken already today has already touched on the uh, behavioral insights work. And I'm also very pleased to welcome um, my co-exec uh, director from the Cabinet Office, uh, David Halpin, who is going to introduce the session, have a quick chat with you, and then he'll hand over to Professor D uh, Dan Ariely. Thank you very much, David. I'll start just really by saying thank you to actually a lot of you in the room who helped us pull together this bit of work. Um, court service, HMRC, of course, um, Manchester, etc. Um, but uh, I mean, it at least gives an illustration of the kind of thing that we do. We get to work in lots of different areas, particularly domestic policy, and see as to whether we can find anything from what we know about how people actually make decisions um, in order to even make what look like quite small adjustments to processes, which can nonetheless sometimes have very big impacts. So we work on health and green and growth and so on, of course. But including this area has been um, great. And actually, one of the, the great things about this for us um, is that it's an area where you can sort of do experiments very rapidly. And that it's all very well starting from kind of quite a wide literature often of lots of interesting insights. But will it actually work in the field will it, or will it not? And of course, many of you engage in quite big operations where it's possible for you to just do some small variations in your approach and very rapidly you find out well, what was effective or was not. So um, I thought I'd just draw out I mean, a, a few quick thoughts. I won't go through the whole report, it's available, I think we just released today and we got a few copies, only a small number with us today but there's a, um, you know, since there are not very many of them, I'm sure you all want to grab one. Um, but, I mean, one of the things that brought us to this area were early results actually on social norms, essentially that we tend to underestimate how virtuous our fellow citizens are. I see Michael Hallsworth at the back, who's of course been doing this work in HMRC, where just a small um, message in a letter, just to tell you that most other people pay their taxes, having quite big impacts. I know Francis talked about that this morning. Um, and that's much discussed, actually often used an example across Whitehall. But other kind of lessons that have come through, I mean, maybe it's a stating the obvious, but it's still interesting to prove it ex kind of experimentally. Is, um, is just make things very straightforward, simplify things, make it straightforward in terms of the message, make it straightforward in terms of how you will act. And actually, quite often when people receive um, a communication from government, they look at it and they're not quite sure what they're being asked, actually. It's quite a complicated letter. It's gone through lots and lots of different official groups saying, yes, actually, it's fine, but you have to have this word, you have to have this phrase, and so on. And the question is, when it actually reaches the punter, do they know what you're asking? And so one of the lessons that's clearly come through a number of these trials is when you simplify the message right down, you often get quite a big improvement in the uptake and the response. So maybe that's completely obvious, but nonetheless, it seems worth re-rehearsing for ourselves, particularly when many of us get drawn into these elaborate conversations about what we can and can't say in a given letter. So that's certainly um, one area. Um, another one is personalized. Um, particularly, of course, because of technology now, we can personalise more and more and at very low cost. And I think one of the most interesting results is the one in, with the court service on, um, on texts. So if you haven't seen this result yet, so essentially it's contrasting, so someone hasn't you know, paid their fine, and now, of course, you can send them a text. Well, sending a text itself gives quite a good boost in the repayment rate. But just um, making the text uh, personalised, so it's got, you know, Dear David, we notice you haven't made your fine, maybe you'll do that, please. Um, then that itself gives a further boost of about another 10 percentage points in the repayment rates. So big savings. Big savings, of course, also to the individual, who then doesn't have bailiffs breaking down their door, which they'll have to pay for too. So um, it's a really powerful result, very simple, and you can see that could be applied in many areas of policy. And the other one, maybe just to draw out of a number, is essentially making something salient, make it obvious what, what you're saying in some other way. So, um, the very early results on the DVLA trials, where you send someone not only their speeding fine, but a picture of, you know, here's your car, um, here's the number plate, make it much more salient. Or indeed, you could say some of the results uh, driven, where well, you make it salient that someone's making an active choice. Like, if you disregard this letter again, we're going to take that as an active choice, and that leading to quite a big change in behavior. 
So um, it's been really interesting, and it's been fascinating. I mean, so we work in across a lot of different policy areas, but what's been particularly exciting about this area is the ability to work with many of you and actually get on and try these things. And often we put out government documents saying, we're going to try this, or we're going to do that, and we're, going to, we're saying what we're going to do in the future. It's been great to be able to, in, in a very short period of time, to be able to say, actually, we're not just saying we're going to do this. We've already tried it out, and look, it works. And this worked, and this one didn't, and so on. It's, it's very powerful and quite unusual. So let me just say something about Dan as he takes it over. Um, one of the great things about working in this area is you get to work with lots of extraordinarily interesting people doing all kinds of very um, interesting and sometimes amusing experiments, um, and you get to learn about them. Um, and Dan Ariely is very much one of those figures who's led the area and made it also very much more accessible. For those of you who don't know his book, or his number of his books, but Predictably Irrational, is a fantastic read still. Um, so, uh, but Dan also has specifically done quite a lot of interesting work on honesty um, um, and what drives it and what affects it. Um, so both looking at real world examples and also lab um, kind of essentially real experiments in that sense too. So Dan, it's fantastic to have you here. We're very lucky to have him here today. So, uh, hello, hello. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, our research on dishonesty, uh, but then I remembered that my ex-wife is British, so you probably know everything about it already. <laughs> um, so let me uh, start by talking in general about uh, behavioral economics. And I, I think one of the kind of prime examples is the problem of self-control. Uh, I, I personally encountered my biggest problem with self-control uh, quite a few years ago. I was in hospital for a long time, and one of the things I got in hospital was a bad blood transfusion. I got a liver disease, and uh, it kind of uh, made my recovery much, much harder. And I didn't know what it was, and about seven years after I was originally injured, I, was, I had another attack, another flare-up. I checked myself into hospital, and he told me I had hepatitis C, a particular version of liver disease. By that time, they could isolate the problem. And they gave me these injections I had to take uh, three times a week for a year and a half. And the problem was that uh, these injections uh, caused me to be quite sick. Uh, about 14, 15 hours of headache, vomiting, shaking, stuff like that, three times a week for a year and a half. Uh, and they told me that if I take those regularly, I might not get liver cirrhosis. 30 years later, but for sure I would have a very miserable year and a half. So imagine yourself with this problem, which is basically the basic problem with healthcare. Imagine you have this injection in your hand and you had to inject your thigh, and if you did it regularly, you might not get liver cirrhosis, but for sure you would be sick for the next 14 hours, and ask yourself whether you would give yourself the medications. Now this is kind of hypothetical, so ask yourself maybe simpler questions. How many of you here, for example, have eaten in the last week more than you wished you would? <laughs> come on, come on. Very good. How many here have exercised in the last month less than you wished you would? Okay. Um, how many in the last year have saved less than you wished you would? How many people here have ever texted while driving? Come on. How many people here have ever had unplanned, unprotected sex? <laughs> nobody, nobody. That's the first time. <clears throat> now, this is the basic problem. And the basic problem is that we are just not designed to do things that are important for us in the long term. We're designed to satisfy our short-term needs and not to think much about the long term. Here's a very general way to think about it. Imagine I asked you, what would you rather have? A half a box of chocolate right now, or a full box of chocolate in a week? I passed the chocolate around. You could see it, you could smell it, it was just here. How many of you would wait a week for another half a box of chocolate? Maybe a few, and you know what? I'm willing to bet that if the chocolate was here, <laughs> you wouldn't be so quick. <laughs> but now, let's imagine we push the choice to the future. I so say, what would you rather have? A half a box of chocolate in a year, or a full box of chocolate in a year and a week? Now realize it's the same exact question. It's asking you whether you're willing to wait another week for another half a box of chocolate. But phrased that way, how many people are willing to wait another week for another half a box of chocolate? I'm guessing everybody, right? Because in the future, we are wonderful people. Right? <laughs> we will exercise, we will diet, we will know sex and drive, we will we'll do all kinds of things like that. Now, 
not that much. And the problem, of course, is that we live in the present. We don't get to live in this wonderful future which we can imagine. So anyway, so I took this medication for a year and a half. When I finished, I had the liver biopsy. They told me that I cleared the disease, was good news. A few months later, the FDA approved this particular combination of interferon and ribavorin as a treatment for hep C, also good news. And my doctor told me that I was the only patient in the protocol who took the medication on time every time. And the question is why? Do I have better self-control than other people? Do I care more about the future? Do I think somehow differently? And the answer is neither of those. The answer is that I design a little trick for myself. Uh, I love movies. If I had time, I would watch lots and lots of movies. Sadly, I don't have much time, so I don't watch that many movies. But on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which were injection days, I would first thing go to a video store. I would rent a few videos I wanted to watch. I would carry them in my backpack the whole day, waiting, looking forward to seeing them. I would get home. I would put a video in. I would uh, inject myself. I would get a blanket and a, a bucket and a blanket for the side effects, and I would press play immediately. I would basically connect it, something I didn't like, the injections with the movies. And I, I didn't wait for the side effects to start. I started the movie the moment I injected myself. Now, if you think about it, this is very strange. First of all, if you made a list of all the things that are important in life, livers will be high up there. And injections and side effects are much less important in an objective way. And because of that, me and all the other patients should have taken our medication all the time. But of course, the effect of the liver is delayed, and the effect of the injections are immediate. So even though the order is liver is much more important than injection, they get reversed. The second thing is that my trick was kind of strange. Because if you think about it, my equation was movies for videos, or movies for injections, or injections for videos. It wasn't anything to do with the liver. Right? And we call this principle reward substitution. And the idea is that there are some things in life that we're just not designed to care about. Maybe we can re-engineer the environment. We could get people to care about something else and act in a way as if they care about their liver in this case. So let me give you two examples for this. Uh, think for a second about global warming. Ask yourself whether we could get people to care about global warming, whether we can get people to wake up in the morning and feel energized that today they're going to do something about it. The answer is probably not. In fact, if you went about it the other way and you said, let's create a problem that would maximize human apathy, right? <laughs> you would choose global warming. Right? Will happen long term in the future to other people first. We don't see anybody suffering. We don't see the problem progressive. Anything we would do is a drop in the bucket, put them all together, you get perfect storm of human apathy. Can you get people to care? Very unlikely. Can we create reward substitutions? Can we get people to behave in other ways that would get them to behave as if they care about global warming? I think there's lots of ways to do it. We can pay people, we can reward them, we could give them tax credits. I think another interesting example is the Toyota Prius. When the Toyota Prius came out, there was another car by Honda that also had this hybrid technology, slightly different, but also. Uh, the Toyota Prius did very well in the US, the Honda hybrid didn't, why? I think part of the reason is that the Toyota Prius looks so different. So if you're sitting there driving your Toyota Prius, not only you can say to yourself, look at me, I'm a wonderful, kind human being who cares about the environment, you can also say, but other people can see me and they can enjoy uh, realizing what a wonderful human being I am, and therefore we take extra pride and extra enjoyment from that. Now, what if we took that as a signal and we tried to get other aspect of our energy consumption to be public? What if the amount of insulation you have in your attic was something that's posted on your Facebook, on what you put your thermostat on? Right? The moment we make something measurable and external, we can start rewarding, pe rewarding people for it. We can use financial reward. You could use ego motivation. There's all kinds of things we can do. I'll give you one more example. Um, there's a medication called Cumidin. Cumidin is an anti-stroke medication. Uh, they give it to people who had the first stroke, and you would hope that they would take it because they don't want the second stroke. Compliance rate, nevertheless, is quite low. Thankfully, there's a new invention called internet-enabled pill boxes. These are pill boxes that the moment somebody is taking the pill, we can know about it. And now we can start rewarding and punishing people. The first step is measuring something, and then we can create reward substitution. Now, you would want people to take their pills because they don't want the second stroke, that doesn't seem to be sufficiently motivating. Can we create something? 
So if we had time, I would ask you to come up with all kinds of ideas of how we can motivate people. Right? We can shame them, we can let their mother know, their kids, their doctor. Uh, we can lock the refrigerator if they don't take their pills on time. I mean, there's lots of ideas. Um, we tried a few things. The first thing we tried was we paid people $3 a day to take their medication on time. What do you think happened? Absolutely nothing. What do you think would happen if we paid people $1,000 a day to take their medication on time? Well, we didn't try that for obvious reasons, but you know, I agree with the intuition. It will probably work. But we don't have $1,000 a day. So what could we do on three? The first thing we tried was we used the principle of loss aversion, the idea that people hate losing more than they enjoy gaining. So we prepaid people in the beginning of the season the amount of money as if they took the medication on time every day for three months. And then every day they didn't take the medication on time, we took it money back from them. Now, we really didn't take money back from them. We just gave it to them in a different way. Turns out that worked. But one of the nicest experiments was done by Kevin Volpe and George Lowenstein. And what they did was they tried two things together. The first thing they did was using lotteries. So imagine that instead of giving people $3 a day to take their pills on time, we gave people a lottery that had 10% chance of making $30. That's more interesting, right? More people take their medication. But then they combine it with something else called regret. And regret is a really interesting emotion. Regret is about the fact that our happiness is not determined by where we are, but a contrast between where we are and a different reality that we can imagine. And if that contrast is positive, we feel good, and if it's negative, we feel bad. So for example, when would you be more unhappy? If you missed your flight by two minutes or by two hours? Two minutes, why? You're stuck in the same miserable airport for the same duration. Why are you more unhappy if you missed it by two minutes? because you can imagine the other reality. It's that close, it's this difference, and it's this contrast between this imagined reality and where you are that makes you miserable. If it's two hours, you can't say to yourself, what if? So that reality is not becoming a contrast. In a few Olympics, they took pictures of people who won the medal, and they tried to analyze how big was their smile. And you would expect gold, silver, bronze. What do we find? Gold, bronze, silver. Why? Imagine you just won the silver medal. Trying for years, you just won the silver medal. What do you think? This close. And if you won the bronze, you say, at least I'm here. Look at all the other people. <laughs> Again, it's not where we are. It's the contrast from where we are and where we think we could have been. So how do you incorporate this into the experiment? Imagine all of you are in Cumidy and the people on my right are taking the medication, the people on my left are not. If we just give a lottery to the people who take their medication, we sample from these people and we give them the medication. But if we try to increase, create regret, we give the lottery ticket to everybody, whether you took the medication or not. And I call you up and I say, congratulations, you're the winner of the coveted lottery. The stars are smiling on you. It's your lucky day. She's smiling. <laughs> sadly, sadly, I see you did not take your pill today. <laughs> so you're not getting the money. This is the principle of regret. You can now think about a small step that separates from getting the money or not, and after you're doing it once, you don't want to experience it again, and compliance rate with Cumidin goes from the 60s to almost 98%. So the point is that there's lots of things that are working against us, and reward substitution is one way to try and fight those tendencies. I'll tell you about, very quickly about one other approach. This other approach we call Ulysses Contracts. And Ulysses Contracts goes back to the story of Ulysses. Ulysses knew that if he would hear the sirens sing, he would be tempted. So what did he do? He tied him, he asked the sailors to tie him to the mast so he could hear this, this song, but he could not follow on his temptation. And he asked the sailors to put Donag in their ears so they would not be even able to be tempted. And this way he, he passed it. And this is a slightly different approach to self-control. It's not about reward substitution. It's about saying we understand that sometimes people would be very much tempted. So we want to create situations that allow people to bypass temptation. I'll give you uh, one example. There's a very nice clock called Clocky. And Clocky is a, uh, is a clock with two big wheels that run in slightly different speeds. And if you have one of those Clockies, you go to sleep at night and you set up the alarm clock at 6 in the morning, and in your mind, you're the kind of person who wakes up at 6 o'clock in the morning and goes for a run. And then 6 o'clock in the morning comes around, 
and you are no longer that person. <laughs> so you try to do this and to silence or snooze the alarm clock, but you, if you have Clocky, Clocky also starts running around the room in unpredictable pattern, and now you have to hunt it down. And you have to get up, and you have to wait for it to go under the bed, and so on, and by the time you find it, you're awake. The big design flaw of Clocky is that by the time you find Clocky, you're also pissed off. <laughs> so there's lots of pictures on the Clockies with the wheel torn off. Uh, and now she's working on a version of Clocky that looks more like an egg that has no breakable parts. Uh, a more extreme version of this is uh, another invention called Snooze and Lose. And Snooze and Lose is an alarm clock that is connected to your bank account. And, and to a charity you hate. <laughs> now, if you give the money to trees or to something good and you want to sneeze and you feel you both, uh, you want to snooze, you want to, you're both sleeping and doing something good for the environment, maybe you're okay with that. But if it's somebody you hate, now you can't sleep anymore. <laughs> so, there's lots of these um, mechanisms. We've done quite a few of them. I'll give you one example. Uh, it turns out in the history of men, uh, nobody has ever woken up and said, today I feel like colonoscopy. <laughs> so what do people do on the days when their colonoscopy are scheduled? They basically find other things to do and they don't show up. So we asked a group of people whether we, they would give us a check for $500. When we scheduled for them a colonoscopy, we said, would you give us a check for $500? And if you show up for your colonoscopy on time, you'll get your money back. And if you don't, you lose the money. Now, this is a deal you can only lose on. I mean, at best, you can stay the same, but you can lose money. There's nothing to gain aside from the knowledge that you will wake up on December 15th and not feel like going to colonoscopy, but if you gave $500 of your own money, that would force you to behave nicely. And indeed, we find that slightly more than 50% of the people are willing to do that. 50% of the people are kind of like Ulysses. They understand that they will have this problem. Now, the interesting thing is that nobody has ever come to any doctor and said, hey, can I give you a check for $500? unprompted, but the moment you prompt people, lots of people understand that this is a useful mechanism and are willing to partake in it. <clears throat> There's a very sad analysis that looks at percentage of human mortality as an outcome of bad decision making. And the analysis basically shows that about 100 years ago, we could attribute about 10% of human mortality to bad decision making. Think about it, you know, people driving into something, uh, cutting themselves, doing all kinds of things that kill themselves. When you repeat the analysis in 2007, it's almost 45%. Why? Because over the years, we've invented lots and lots of technologies that are very capable of killing us. Think about things like smoking, cars, diabetes, obesity. You know, in principle, the donut is a great invention. Right? If you can create a donut and give it to people who are starving, that would be fantastic. We've condensed sugar and fat in a really efficient uh, container. The problem, of course, is that they're everywhere and they're tempting us. And what do you think is going to be the next version of the donut? Is it going to be donut 2.0? Is it going to be more tempting or less tempting than the current donut? Probably more tempting. And the next version of Facebook is going to be more tempting or less tempting? Probably more tempting. And the next version of the smartphone is going to tempt us more or less to uh, check email while we drive. Probably more. So we all have Adam and Eve problem. Problem between now and later. And the, the reality is that we're going to get more and more of these problems all the time. And the question is, what, how do we deal with those? Uh, do we just let people assume that people are going to be capable of dealing with these problems by themselves? Or do we need to help people uh, overcome those. And I think both of those approaches, the reward substitution and Ulysses contracts, are things that people need to need help with. So I could come up with movies for one particular thing, maybe each of you come up with one particular self-control problem for one thing you do, but the reality is it's very hard to come up with their own mechanisms, and I think people need help in dealing with this incredible temptation we're dealing with. Um, I do want to say, uh, switch topic and take uh, just a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about dishonesty. Um, we've been doing lots of experiments on dishonesty. We tempt people to steal money from us. And the way we do it is we have a sheet of paper with 20 simple math problems. We pass them around and we tell people, please, solve as many of those as you can. We'll give you a dollar per question. 
And when you finish, we say stop, five minutes are over. Five minutes are not enough to solve all the problem. We say stop, put your pencil down, take your sheet to the back of the room and shred it. And then come back and tell me how many questions you solved correctly. <laughs> people come back, they said they got about six problems correctly, we paid them six dollars. What the people in our experiments don't know is that we played with the shredder. So the shredder only shred the sides of the page <laughs> But the main body of the page remains intact. And we can find out what people actually do. And what we find is that lots of people cheat just by a little bit. Most people solve four problems and report they solve six. And we run this experiment on about 30,000 people so far. I included some British people. Um, <coughs> we ran this experiment about 30,000 people. We found 12 people who cheated in a big way. And we lost about $150 to them. Uh, and we found 18,000 people who cheated a little bit, and we lost $36,000 to them. And I think that's kind of a good, probably, reflection for reality. There are big crooks out there from time to time, and they steal a lot of money individually, but because they're so few, it's not a big deal. Uh, in contrast, there's lots of people who can cheat a little bit and feel good about themselves, and I think we can go back, but I think this is the cause for the American uh, financial crisis. Um, <clears throat> lots of people, you know, Madoff is one, drop in the bucket compared to all the cheating of lots of people who still think of themselves as good people. Now, why people, why people cheat in that, in that way? <clears throat> uh, and what can we do about it? So, what we find is that people are not reacting to financial incentives, but instead what people seem to be doing is to balance two things. They try to look at the mirror and do things that are consistent with them feeling good about themselves. And we also went to benefit from cheating. And you can say, how could you do both? It turns out if you cheat just a little bit, you could do both. You can still look at yourself in the mirror and feel good and benefit from cheating. So we tried to decrease it in a few ways. Uh, the first approach came to us from a little joke. And I'll give you the Jewish version. The joke is that a guy goes to the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. Somebody stole my bicycle from synagogue. And the rabbi is saying, this is awful, this is terrible, I can't believe this is happening. Here is what you do. Come to synagogue next week, sit in the front row, and as we go over the Ten Commandments, turn around and look at everybody else in the eyes. And when we get to thou shall not steal, see who can't look you in the eyes, you'll know, that's your guy. He's very excited about the suggestion. He comes, sit in the front row, turns around, Ten Commandments. At the end of the service, he comes to the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, you wouldn't believe it. It worked like a charm. The moment, the moment we got to thou shall not commit adultery. <laughs> I remembered where I left my bike. <laughs> uh, I don't have much time, but this, this little joke led us to all kinds of research about what happens if we remind people about their own moral standards. What if we ask people to recite the Ten Commandments? What if we get people to sign at the top of the documents? What happens if we do all kinds of things like that? And we find that it dramatically reduces cheating. In fact, we did an experiment um, with an insurance company where we got people to sign in the beginning of the form, in ten of the end of the form, and we saw that it decreased cheating by about 15%. Um, now, the, the inside group have recently uh, uh, run a related study uh, in Manchester, I think, right? Um, where they tried to change uh, one of the forms, and it didn't increase uh, compliance. It didn't decrease cheating in the way that we, that we thought, so it's kind of interesting, and we're going to look at uh, what are the differences and what are the nuances of getting people to think about their own morality and when does it actually decrease uh, dishonesty. Uh, I do want to tell you one more thing. So we found, in general, that getting people to think at the moment of temptation about their own morality decreased cheating. We also find some in distressing news about what get, people to cheat, what get people to cheat more. To a little joke, uh, Johnny comes home from school with a note from the teacher that said a little Johnny stole a pencil from the kid who's sitting next to him. And Johnny's father is furious. It's angry, he's saying, Johnny, I can't believe you're doing this to me. I can't believe you steal a pencil from the kid who's sitting next to you. I'm embarrassed and humiliated. This is not how we raised you. You're grounded for three weeks and just wait until your mother comes. And beside Johnny, if you need a pencil, you know very well you could just say something. You can just ask, and I can bring you dozens of pencils from work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Now, I think the reason this joke is slightly uh, uh, funny is because we recognize that if we take a pencil from work, by being it multiple steps removed from money, we can justify it to a much higher degree. Well, if we take 10 cents per petty cash box, we would feel very guilty. We can't not think of ourselves as thieves if we take money. And indeed, that's what we find. We find that when we get people to cheat directly for money, they cheat much less. When we get them to cheat for tokens or mortgage-backed securities or uh, dividends or other things, the moment you get multiple steps removed from money, you don't think it's real money, uh, cheating increases. Um, so there's lots more to say about, about cheating. Uh, I think like many other behavioral uh, phenomena, it's, it's interesting, it's intricate, and most importantly, it's not what we believe naturally. Right? Our intuition about what causes people to behave is often not what, really, what causes people to really behave. And, and the science of, of behavioral economics, uh, social science in general, has been continuously uh, uh, baffling ourselves about the things that we find about why people behave the way they do and so on. And, and I think with this incredible, for me, the main lesson from behavioral economics is how little we understand human behavior and how bad our intuitions are. And I think this is probably, nowhere is it better to think about it in regulation. When we create regulation, we have an image of the people that we try to regulate. And the question is, is this image accurate or not accurate? And the idea that we could trust our intuitions about what is this, I think, is preposterous. And because of that, I'm incredibly excited about this group because it's the first group in the world, I think, that is basically willing to uh, take step and say, you know, the truth is we just don't know. And rather than create tremendous programs that might work, might not work, nobody would ever know, let's do some experiments. It might not be popular, it might be hard, it's a lot of work, and doing them right is very complex. But nevertheless, I don't see any other way in which we can actually create regulations that uh, are effective. If you trust our intuition, they're only worth as much as our intuition. And I would suggest that our intuition is much more flawed than you're um, willing to accept. Um, do we have a minute or are we finished? We finished. I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs>